peace to all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The lesson for meditation this morning is the epistle lesson read a moment ago from 2 Peter 3. And our sermon theme today is entitled, Advent is from Patience to Peace. Dear friends and beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. One thing you can say about us as a group of people is that we're not very patient. If we want something, we want it right now. And there's a lot of impatience that goes along this time of year. We want all of the Christmas preparations and the shopping to be over with. We want Christmas to hurry up and get here because we want our presents and we want them right now. But one thing about us is not only are we impatient with stuff as we live our lives, we also get very impatient with God sometimes. If we have a problem and we're praying to God, we want God to answer the problem in our way and in our timing instead of waiting on His perfect way and His perfect time. Sometimes we look around and we see all the bad stuff happening in the world. And we just want God to hurry up and right all of the wrong. And we want Him to do it right now. We wonder how come God is just letting all this stuff slide. What's God's problem? And of course, it's obvious that impatience is going to cause nothing but stress. But the truth is, our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Being a Christian is not about us conforming God into the way we want Him to be, but it's about God conforming us into the likeness of His Son, Jesus. So as you know, Advent's a time of preparation for the coming of our Lord, and God's word of love for you this morning is that our calling to be Advent people of God starts with patience and it ends with peace. So this Advent movement from patience to peace is really taught pretty nicely in the text today from 2 Peter 3. This Advent movement starts with patience. How often are we impatient with God's patience? Why doesn't God just hurry up and come back already like He promised He would? Well, listen again to verses 8 and 9. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now back in Peter's time, there were a lot of people who were really, really impatient with God. Because in Peter's day, people didn't like believers of Jesus. People who believed in Jesus were persecuted. They were mistreated. They were sometimes thrown in jail. Now when Jesus had promised he was going to come back, they were thinking, oh, well, he's going to come back very quickly and get us out of all of these problems that we have. But then he didn't come back. And so they started to wonder, well, maybe he's not really coming back. Did he break his promise to us? Were we wrong in believing him? And the truth is, sometimes we think the same way. If we're facing some sort of money problem, or we're facing physical pain, or there's somebody who we love, who we've hurt, or they've hurt us deeply, or we're afraid, we start to wonder where Jesus is. We might be tempted to expect Him to use all of His mighty power to fix all of our earthly problems, and we think He needs to do it right now. What's taking Jesus so long, we wonder? Well, the reason for God taking so long was told to us in verse 9. Listen to it again. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should reach repentance. So the first step is patience, and then we move from patience to perish. God's patience is for a gracious and a loving reason. What would happen if Jesus came back when we wanted him to? If Jesus came back the first time that we got into trouble and we wanted him to just bail us out, stop and think about all of the people who do not yet know Jesus that would be lost because they haven't had the chance yet to come to repentance. See, God loves them too. Jesus died for their sins also. That is exactly the reason that John the Baptist came, to preach repentance so that souls would be saved from sin and death. So Jesus' patience is, about, is preventing the perishing of many who do not yet know him. Now, it says that one day he will come as he promised. Listen to verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Okay, so we have patience, we have perish, and now we have passing away. All of the things that we cling to that doesn't have anything to do with God, and all the stuff that we think is important that doesn't have anything to do with God, one day will be destroyed. In fact, they have to be destroyed because if they become so important to us that they get in our relationship with God, if they get in the way of God, it would be good if God took them away. He says when he comes back, nothing earthly is going to be left standing and that's going to be a really stunning and spectacular day. So God says that this creation filled with sin one day will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. Well, next, the text moves on to people. Now that we know all of this, the question is, what sort of people should we be? How should we act? Well, listen again to verses 11 and 12. Since all of these things are thus going to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? So, should we be people who don't care about God, blow off His promises, or... Should we be people who do the best we can to try to live in holiness and godliness? Well, you have the Holy Spirit because you're a child of God. So the Holy Spirit leads you to live a life of love, of service to each other, and lives that are dependent on and worshiping of Jesus. Now sometimes we fail. But for you... Jesus left heaven and all the gloriness of heaven to come back here to his sin-corrupted corrupted world because he wanted to make everything right, what had gone so wrong because of sin. It is for you that Jesus came back and humbled himself to be a servant. It is for you that Jesus went to the cross and the grave it is for you that Jesus rose from the dead. And it is for you that Jesus will come back one day. And when he comes back, he's going to gather you together to be with him and all of the believers. That is God's promise to you. So because you are God's people, he has made this promise. His promise is a new heaven and a new earth. That doesn't have anything to do with sin. Listen again to verse 13. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. So unlike the things that we make, 
and the things that we build, God promises something that's much better. Instead of having a place that is always having to deal with the problems of sin, God's new creation is going to be a place where there's nothing but righteousness, where everything is holy, everything is godly, and that means that you won't suffer any more sadness or pain or fear or anger or death because sin's not going to be there to cause any of these problems. So there'll be no more physical sickness, no more money problems, no more worry, no more being in need, nothing but happiness and joy and praise all the time. Now, during Advent, we look back to remember how God always keeps all of His promises. And how, truthfully, Jesus in the manger at Christmas was just the start of things. And at the same time, we also look forward because He has promised to come back. That's the one promise He hasn't yet kept, but He will. We know He will come again because God always keeps His promises. A lot of people get afraid when they start thinking about the end of the world. But the truth is, you don't have to be afraid because when Jesus comes back to build His new heaven and new earth, you're going to have a home in that creation and that means you're going to finally be able to be joyous and beautiful again just the way God wanted it to be in the first place. And then finally, once He does keep that promise, there's going to be peace. We'll be at peace because we'll be living in a creation where peace and joy is going to be the only thing that's there. Listening into verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. That's the good news you have. You are in Christ. And being in Christ makes you spotless and blemish-free in God's eyes. He forgives you. Verse 14 isn't about what you better do or else you'll be in trouble. But instead, verse 14 tells us about what God did for you in Jesus. God has made you one with Jesus in your baptism. So, as a result of being one with Jesus, you are at peace. You've been connected back to the Father through Jesus. So now there is peace between you and God. So as a messenger of God's peace, as God is being patient, desiring repentance, we can now use Advent to help other people prepare for the coming of Jesus. So, Advent is a movement through what we call the six P's. Advent is about God's patience so that nobody would perish. And though this old creation will pass away, we're going to be God's people waiting in holiness and godliness because we've been given a promise. And the promise is that we will have Peace in Christ. And even with our impatience, with all the things that are going wrong in the world today, there is nothing that is too big of a problem for God to handle. Jesus is the solution to every single problem, even the problems of sin and death. So this Advent, remember, Jesus loves you. And Jesus is coming for you. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the second coming. Amen. We rise for the singing of the Magnificat on pages 10 and 11.